Taras Pluskin here at the Top Shelf Aquatics Farm. Now I'm here in front of a tank I don't normally get to film in front of, because today we're gonna to be going over some wonderful individuals here in our fish QT system. Anyone going into this system is going to be a fish that's going to eventually be a proud working animal here at our coral farm. And as a result, we don't want them to be bringing in any diseases and the like, so they spend a little bit of time here in QT. Now, what do we have here waiting in QT? Well, we have some wonderful, wonderful specimens, and wonderful in, in many different ways. First off, well, these are Zebrazoma flavescens. These are yellow tangs. Uh, you can't think of a species which this industry and this hobby owes more to than the yellow tang. This is a fish that was once available for $20, $30 at, at local fish stores and for a generation of early reefers in the mid 20th century, they were perhaps one of the first jaw dropping examples of the infinite power, vibrancy and coloration that saltwater fish and reef aquarium fish can offer. So as a result, thousands, thousands, millions of yellow tanks were purchased and scattered throughout the world to bring wonder and delight to people looking at reef tanks everywhere from Dubai all the way to Greenwich, England, all the way to here in Florida. Uh, so let's think about this tang for just a moment. Uh, these yellow tangs, these wonderful specimens. And let's consider just for a moment the journey that each and every one of these initial yellow tangs took. Yellow tangs are not carps. They are not goldfish. They are not tetras or even easier South American or African cichlids. These are fish with relatively nuanced care requirements as we've gone over in other videos. They need good water quality. They need appropriate forage. And frankly, early on in the reef aquarium industry, the vast majority of people that purchase these animals did not fully understand these nuanced care requirements. And thus, for the vast majority of yellow tangs, if not all of them, it was a one-way trip. Surely, some yellow tangs did fine and then produced wonderful adult specimens inside of captivity, but for the most part, the industry became dependent on wild stocks of yellow tangs. And as a result, this once prolific, commonly available $20, $30 fish rose and rose and rose and rose in price and dropped and dropped and dropped in common availability. And for the first time in history, the reef aquarium industry stared into a future that may not have yellow tangs in aquariums. Now, this was simply unacceptable to the generation of aquarists and children that had grown up with these animals, witnessed them in captivity, and had been inspired by their beauty. Thus, organizations such as Rising Tide was inspired as an idea that aquarium fish if deemed so important to the aquarium industry and our cultural values, that they should be aquacultured and farmed and supplied consistently, just like every other necessary organism that we interact with on a daily basis. Now, this had many extreme challenges. We talked about where all these wild tangs came from. They came from this pelagic larval state and the seemingly infinite roll of the dice where only a few select individuals out of thousands were be given the chance to actually develop into the adult organism. This is something that scientists, ichthyologists, fish specialists very poorly understood. You can't follow one of these larvae in your survey boats across its entire journey. So as a result, huge knowledge gaps existed, like huge empty abysses of knowledge as to what tangs needed early in life. What do their larvae need? How do they grow? What do they eat? These are questions that could only be solved through the imperative of needing to aquaculture fish and supply them for the reef aquarium industry. Thus, in this episode, we're gonna be spotlighting a brief history in the aquaculture of tangs and the efforts that have been done by some very, very smart and dedicated people to bring these aquaculture tangs into existence and then spread the knowledge of what it took to get us there so that these things can be aquacultured and available for the future to come. So, very briefly, let's talk about the history of the aquaculture of this specific species right here, Zemersoma flavescens. The yellow tang was the first tang to be fully aquacultured. Success came at the University of Hawaii's Pacific campus at Hilo. This is where years and years and years of trying to get these fish to breed was, was a daunting effort. 
In 2015, they were able to successfully breed the first batch of yellow tangs. They did this by having broodstock of extremely high nutritional quality. They were able to get lucky spawns and then they fed them everything they could to make sure that those larvae were adequately fed. So one of the tricks we'll go over in other videos is that unlike freshwater fish, marine fish come out very, very small and very, very, very uh, intolerant larvae. They need high quality, polyunsaturated fatty acid and rich food, and they need it small because they have a very small, fragile mouth and a very simple, unsophisticated gut. So one of the magic foods that the University of Hawaii team worked with was a pelagic copepod known as Parvocalanus crossirostris. And this pelagic copepod has a very, 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 very small larval noplii state that's also ridiculously rich in golden fats, polyunsaturated fatty acids. So by using those Parvocalanus crossirostris, which had to be enriched and fed with live phytoplankton, and then also as those tangs got bigger, throwing in rotifers and uh, enriched artemia, and then also specialized micro diets, the University of Hawaii team was able to actually grow a few yellow tangs all the way through the larval life cycle into what we would consider a fully competent juvenile yellow tang. This is extremely exciting, and this breakthrough would have wonderfully dramatic ramifications throughout the world of aquaculture and the reef aquarium industry. Something that could, should be considered is that from the time that those early eggs were hatched and fertilized to the time where they were something that even closely resembled a small version of what we would consider an actual juvenile yellow tang, it took over 70 days post-hatch to get from that state over to that juvenile fish. And that was a devastating period where over 50,000 of those different larvae were reduced to just a few dozen in number. For each different stage of larval growth and then eventually the metamorphosis, a state called flexion, where a larvae fish turns into a juvenile marine fish, uh, this was accompanied with devastatingly high mortality. So this presented the Hugh Hawaii team with rejoice that they had succeeded in actually breeding tangs, but also many perilous questions acknowledging that you know throughout this cycle there were many bottlenecks which were dramatically reducing success. Later that year in 2015 a team at the University of Florida's Tropical Aquaculture Center in Ruskin, Florida was able to carry on and translate what everyone had learned from Callan's work growing the yellow tang and were able to successfully aquaculture para incanthurus hepatis, the Pacific hippo blue tang as well. This is incredibly exciting because we found that even though the similar pitfalls existed where we had only you know, 27 individuals survive out of 50,000 eggs, but many of the lessons that allowed for the aquaculture of the yellow tang translated directly into that of the blue tang. And this was incredibly exciting. So things such as using those Parvocalanus crossirostris noplii and using other really high quality water quality techniques and using other uh, enriched live feeds was essential for the success of breeding both these species. Success continued in the 2020s, where in 2022, Quality Marine over in Los Angeles and a few other facilities over in the Pacific were able to breed Zebrasoma xanthurum, the purple tang, for the first time as well. So we can see here more and more of this knowledge was able to be observed by other groups and other organizations, and they were able to translate that into breeding other species for the first time. This gets even more exciting when we get later into 2022, when uh, Surge Aquatics over in Sarasota, Florida, was able, actually able to produce the world's first hybridized tang, where for the first time, a tang had been created, which did not exist in any numbers, at least out in the wild. So let's talk about a few key bottlenecks and pitfalls that arose when it came to these early studies aquaculturing these tang species. One early pitfall was we really needed to understand more about what adult tangs needed nutritionally. There was a lot that we knew that would keep them alive, but only certain diets and certain strategies, water quality, light parameters and the like, that would get them to not only grow, but then develop their full egg maturation cycle so that they would actually spawn uh, at a relatively predictable rate with the moon cycle so that those eggs can be collected and worked with in the first place. The second major pitfall was being able to acknowledge the important live feeds that we need to be able to breed marine fish, especially sensitive marine fish larvae like tangs in the first place. Acknowledging the use of Parvocalanus crossirostris 
their Noplii and other small, very highly valuable, really nutritionally dense copepod species were really, really valuable in being able to get these fish to eat for the first time in the first place. Other approaches, such as when uh, Courtney O's and the uh, University of Florida's lab on the Indian River were able to breed their hippo tangs, they were actually using ciliates as a first feed as well. It's very exciting to consider all the different myriad of organisms which might be absolutely essential to our fish and all of our favorite reef fish in their first early days of life. And then lastly, another major pitfall acknowledged by these early studies is that as these larval fish, even if they're surviving those first couple weeks of growth, as they're approaching flexion or that metamorphous state, every single one of these species exhibits really high mortality around that metamorphic period. So it's a very stressful time, like adolescence is for all of us, but this is something that makes aquaculturists and scientists and reef, should make reef keepers fascinated as well, where there is this massive amount of nutritional need that's needed for these larvae right before they metamorphose into what we consider a fish. And developing appropriate feeding strategies for long-term nutrition uh, is really exemplified in these early days of growth where we might not see long-term nutritional deficiencies in our adult fish, but they cannot be ignored when trying to create them de novo. Let's talk about the major benefits from these studies as well that have made incredible long-lasting ramifications for the reef aquarium industry now and for the years to come. Firstly, these were published studies, especially with the breeding of the blue tang and the yellow tang for the first time. These papers are available. Anyone can read them and anyone can learn from them, meaning that all of that knowledge and effort and resources that went into making those precious few first dozen individuals can now be translated to the average home aquarist, the next generation of aquaculturists that wants to bring these wonderful animals into captivity in a sustainable way, and then also uh, to other facilities that, especially commercial ones, that can then take what the researchers have done and scale it up in a larger scale so that individuals can actually be produced. These wonderful individuals that you see behind me were made by Biota, uh, a corporation which is aquaculturing yellow tangs, and that we can then purchase because they produce them at a large enough scale so that there is some sort of commercial availability. And as more and more studies about the biology of tangs are released, more and more companies will be able to commercially produce them, increasing the amount of species that are available in the hobby, aquacultured, and also eventually lowering, lowering their price as supplies rise. So what do I mean when I call these yellow tangs behind me from Biota the sentinels of a bold new sustainable dawn for the reef aquarium hobby? Well, I consider sustainability a facet of three different factors. The first is environmental. There are only so many wild yellow tangs in the wild. As the reef aquarium industry expands and expands and expands and more and more people are inspired and more and more countries get access to the tools they need to keep reef aquariums at home, the demand for yellow tangs will always be on the rise in perpetuum. So environmental sustainability should always consider that that natural production at best can remain at its current cap, at worst may lower in the future. So environmental sustainability and pursuing the aquaculture of these organisms is, is something to always keep in mind that as a mechanism to safeguard this wild population while still offering individuals that can be kept in aquariums. The second is economic sustainability where as that demand rises and rises and rises and supply falls and falls and falls, especially with the closing of collection sites, wild caught yellow tangs will most likely forever increase in price and most likely will foreverly increase outside of the grasp of the average reef hobbyist. And the last is cultural sustainability, which is perhaps more important to the reef aquarium industry than anything else. Sustainability in the sense that these animals have existed and touched our lives in a profoundly beneficial way. There is not a reef aquarist around that does not potentially see the value of these ambassador animals. And even though a lot of those tangs are initially brought into tanks in the past, have passed away, the lasting inspiration that they have brought to humanity has given us the individuals, the economic incentive, and in the cultural incentive to 
breed these animals. And by breeding these animals de novo, completely from the egg, we have learned so much more about what they are, what they need, and just how precious it is when a small egg gets to be the size of one of these individuals that you see is behind me. That cultural sustainability, that need for the public to always be able to see and be inspired by this fish is another incredibly dr incredible driving factor, which makes it all make sense in the long term. And then lastly, in conclusion, is another fascinating nuanced concept, especially one perpetuated by that Sarasota facility, Surge Aquatics. They produced a hybrid tang, which is not really commonly available anywhere in the wild. You'll see a hybrid now and again, but it's, it's something unique. For the first time, if we understand these tangs and we're able to breed them again and again and again in captivity, just as we've done with freshwater fish, just as we've done with every other domesticated animal, we can create something new. The infinite different colors and patterns that came from the breeding of Ocellaris clownfish can be seen again with tangs, where not only are we really, really, really trying to grip onto a supply of those colors and classics that we know and love, but we will be giving ourselves, commercial producers, and the average reef aquarist the tools to produce and see something that we've never seen before. A novel spectacle that understands and appreciates the beauty that nature's provide us and is a manifestation, a representation of us taking all that knowledge and creating something new and beautiful from it. So for all those reasons, I love aquaculture tangs. I believe in aquaculture tangs. And I would love to talk about aquaculture tangs any chance I can get. So uh, without further ado, We'll be seeing these guys in the farm system soon, and we'll see you next time.